All right, so I'm in my garage here shooting this, not in the studio. I, I hope it's a clear picture. I'm by myself, but we'll see what we can do. So it's April 6th, 2021. We're just starting to wind down with COVID. Uh, most of the people got their first shot already. And um, like I said, it's April 6th. In January, somebody from the Store Society gave me this uh, ham radio and wanted to know more about it and to fix some of the broken parts and possibly get it working. So uh, my friend Paul Rogers uh, helped me. Uh, we tore this apart, analyzed it, bought, purchased parts for it. So all the original parts are here. And I'm gonna here to tell you about this radio. So uh, this was made between 1958 and 1962. And they sold them up to 1964. And it was made in a Oh, the wind is blowing the uh, straps and making noise. Hang on. Okay. Okay. So um, this was made in Litchburg, Virginia. And uh, they opened this plant in June 25th, 1957. It was uh, 264,000 square feet. And what the plan was to move the three facilities in New York, and they were in Syracuse, Ithaca, and Clyde, and uh, in 1959, they spent six months moving everybody and everything to this plant. Now, one thing that happened during this time, this is when uh, things were switching over to transistors, you know, and uh, things were able to get more compact. So, uh, you know, they were going to be, GE was going to be a leader in all this. So, um, of all the radios they made, this one is the most desirable. It's the most collectible, and it's one of their better radios. Now, one thing that's really funny, what I found out, this was designed for a police motorcycle, uh, specifically a Harley, and it fit perfect in the saddlebag. Now, I said, oh, come on, the saddlebag's got to be bigger, but I saw those motorcycles, and this fits perfect in there, and then the, the walkie-talkie would be, uh, not walkie-talkie, the microphone, they could have uh, up by their handlebars. So uh, this thing comes with a volume control, a squelch control, a uh, 12 volt uh, power supply. Uh, this button here is the on off switch. And these yellow uh, lights would probably go on when um, mic was keyed or you're receiving. Now this was for an antenna and every one I saw, obviously it um, was not there, okay. now. I did see a 110 charging plug online. Uh, I don't know where they plugged it in. It, it wasn't the same plug as the microphone, but uh, one of the pictures, oh, actually this one, it shows a 110 plug with a plug where they plugged it in somewhere. And I'll explain where the 110 comes uh, when I take this apart. So here's a picture of the uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee facility, okay? And uh, they did three expansions to this, and we'll talk about that. So, uh, well, I'll tell a little history here. Um, so they, you know, you know, the plant had all moved down in 1959, and in 1960 and 1962, the office building in front they expanded uh, twice, and um, so this facility was 268 square feet when they were done with all the expansions and then they also expanded the warehouse in 1962. In, in 1962 it ended up being 417,000 square feet, all right? So they still ran out of office space and two and a half miles away uh, on Carroll Avenue and the Carroll spelled with two R's and two L's. It was two and a half miles away and uh, they uh, abbreviated it CAP, Carroll Avenue Plant. Um, it was an old cotton mill that had closed down and um, and in 1958, they sort of moved their customer service, parts department, and did some sub-assembly. And they also did, they did promotional sales there. And, uh, okay. So um, they were there for quite a while. Then in uh, well, 1976, the owner really raised the lease. I call it rent, but they raised the lease of the building way high. And then, so they left uh, in 1976. So... Okay, so uh, in November 69, two miles 
in another direction from the main plant. Uh, they opened more office space uh, to help them out. And uh, let's see what I got here. In October 1970, uh, they, oh, they, they bought a plant that was uh, 235 miles away. I'm surprised I don't have the city here. But that, so you know what happened those years? That's when things started going to plastic. So uh, this facility was for metal and plastic fabrication. It was 235 miles away south. And every day a truck went back and forth. Every day. And I got uh, some people online that uh, talked about that. So um, like I said, here's the facility. It looks like it's as big as a Myers. And um, there's a huge parking lot over here, but I've seen other pictures. That parking lot was just as huge over here and just as huge behind it. And, and I'm, uh, I laminated this. This tells about the radio, but uh, unfortunately I don't have the model number on there. And then um, here's a plant um, that was operation till uh, 1957. And uh, here's a factory there, and it looks like 50% men and women. Now, what I see is a 50 assembly lines about 30 to 40 feet long, where they would go down assembly line, then they would they would pass it behind them, and then they would do assembly line there, and then they would pass it behind it and go back and forth. And um, it was really interesting. I saw the outside of this plant, and um, it looks like... You know, I made a mistake. It wasn't 1957. It was 1947 they left. Um, it looks like they were making radar. And I saw some radar dishes, and these some of these devices look like scopes that you would read, uh, radar would read on the scope. Uh, I've seen air traffic control ones, and it looked very similar to what the air traffic controllers use for visioning planes. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but when uh, England was in trouble, World War II, um, Churchill made a deal with the United States and said, listen, if you help us through this war, we will give you all our trade secrets uh, um, that we had. One of them was radar. And uh, I think this happened about 1939. Uh, so the United States agreed and, um, and uh, you know, GE jumped on the bandwagon to uh, transistor radios. Now in 1938, they started with uh, AM band radios and then they moved to FM band radios. Well, this was the first one uh, VHS, or VHF, VHF band. Uh, so that was a huge technology. The uh, resistors was a huge technology. Using plastic was a huge technology. And this all happened in the late 50s, you know. Okay, so I have some of the fasteners apart to make this go faster. So, you know, this has really good lockdowns. You can hold them. The microphone can be held on each side, and this pulls out. Come on, baby. Well, I have the screws out, so it's sort of like expanding when I pull it. There we go. And we'll do this because that's the front. So here's uh, some of the work here. Totally ingenious work. And then um, here's a fuse for uh, 12 volts that comes into here. Now this thing's pretty interesting. Here is uh, nickel cad batteries. You know, you think nickel cad was just like invented like 10 years ago. Well, here's two nickel cad batteries, all right? And these are uh, one and a half volt each, okay? And this is the cool part here. Because I bet you you've never uh, seen this since the 60s. Um, these are two 67 and a half volt batteries, right? There's smaller batteries in here. So this is, two of these together is where you got your 110, right? So uh, uh, these were batteries for this device. And another thing that's really cool, all these things swing out. I got the screw out in here, you know, here, and here's a, a wiring diagram that's in perfect condition. Right here, and there's some plugs here, so you can test. Um, you know, if you're having issues, you can test here uh, for to see wh uh, what might be wrong. I just, and then here's some transition transistors that are color coded, right? 
Okay. So uh, actually, there's a screw that holds this in. I took out, and on the other side, this swings out. And what they do is they have these uh, quarter turn. You push it in a quarter turn. And here's another wiring diagram that's just perfect shape, perfect condition. And uh, well, like I said, I unscrewed it to uh, move things along in the video. So I'm not sure where the 110 went. Like I said, I see the plug in the picture. I see the hole pattern for the plug. Not, not sure. I'm positive it doesn't go in the same hole the microphone goes in. So uh, this is a pretty good find. Also, it has the call numbers here for your station, station 14. And uh, here's, uh, I think their band was 14-8. Okay, so let me tell you about ham radios. When you, um, like I know a guy that had a business uh, doing um, pest control and, uh, you know, those cell, those, uh, they didn't call them cell phones, satellite phones were so expensive. They're like six to eight grand. So he, uh, I asked him, well, what did you pay for your uh, station uh, radio? He says, well, you couldn't buy it. You have to, you had to lease it. And it was $60 uh, for each uh, unit. And what he did, he kept uh, one in each car and one at home base. And he would communicate with his uh, employees. And it was important to communicate because uh, like a customer might, might not be home or uh, is it possible to do a customer in between a customer somebody just called uh, so otherwise what you'd had to do back then is you'd have to use the customer's phone to call or you'd stop somewhere and use a pay phone and call uh, so these uh, ham radios made it work they're private channels he said that he had like three channels to choose uh, he, he went five miles range, but he could go 10 on a good day. Now, the police department has a private radio, and they have repeaters all over the city. I, I've seen several. So they can go all Oakland County and all Detroit and maybe even further. So, uh, But one of the things that's happened um, in the last 20 years is you used to be able to keep uh, some type of radio with a scanner and you could listen to anybody's uh, frequency. It, it was against the law to uh, have a receiver, uh, not a receiver, the uh, transmitter, but you could listen for free. And I remember listening to people uh, contact uh, an operator so they could make a phone call from their car. They actually didn't have a dial at their car. They would have to say, oh, listen, I need you to call Three four three seven zero three three. Um, you know they didn't even bother giving the zip code or the area code because the whole state was pretty much three one three, and uh, then they would dial it and then they would communicate. But uh, I remember my friend when we were twelve, so that was nineteen seventy. We he had an eight band radio and we could pick up uh, people in cars, people on uh, CBs, people on ham radios, uh, airlines. We could hear and. I think police. Uh, ours didn't uh, scan, but you could you could uh, listen to police. But so since then they've done something digital that you can't use a scanner anymore for the police, and um, it bounces, and uh, so you, you there's no such thing as a police scanner anymore. You can't you can't listen to them. So I called the police station and I said, well, what does it cost uh, for you to set that up? And he says, you know that's part of the government now and uh, we don't pay for that uh, but we do have communication in every car and um, every station and uh, and that's all set up for us from the county so uh, well, all right so I just wanted to go over this I think it's pretty cool I don't dare put power to it and you know because these batteries are so old I just think it's a gem you know I never saw ever ready battery this old that didn't leak Right? You know, if you were born in the 50s or 60s, you remember? They would leak and ruin all your toys. But um, I think it's just great where it is. Now, what happened was something broke one of these knobs and snapped the potentiometer. Uh, Paul was able to find a potentiometer. I actually found two of the original knobs I bought. And um, so they're uh, two period, the knobs. And uh, so it's pretty cool.
that you know just for a few bucks we got this thing about as good as it can get you know I wish we had antenna I, okay so, uh, obviously when it went into a motorcycle uh, they would probably have to have some external antenna because you'd have the box closed I'm pretty sure um, to keep it out of the elements but you know great find and uh, so when you go to the museum there Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society uh, it's abbreviated G W B hs.com greater west bloomfield historical society you could um, visit there uh, they're open uh, like the third sunday of the month for sure and then they're open for special events but uh, so great fun talk to you